So when we met the collector, it was not the collector actually, it was Shantashila Nair, Madam Shantashila Nair, who was brought in here to head uh, the tsunami response. Okay. And then Sushma said, look, I am coming from here. And we found that uh, disposal of dead bodies was a major issue. Is there any such problem over here? What we saw in Tamil Nadu was a huge number of bodies uh, washed ashore. Because there were so many bodies, not only they were human and also animal, uh, one, it became very important that you first uh, um, manage to dispose the carcass completely of the animals and the bodies. Uh, and should be done very quickly because otherwise it can spread, um, uh, it can create diseases. So um, uh, Shanta Shalanar ma'am said yes, we have that as a major problem because you have a lot of uh, water and uh, yes. so how will you help us? What, no, how do you think you can help us do this? Cremation cannot be possible, burial is not possible because quick dis decomposition is not taking place. Uh, one of our members in, in Kutch, um, they uh, have developed uh, a, a kind of soluble which enables very quick decomposition uh, of, of uh, bodies and carcasses. And so we immediately, you know, got that transported in. That was the first thing we activated and we said, would you need this help and we can get this. And uh, it, it, they immediately responded and we immediately got the organization here, uh, the industry in, in Gujarat. And that was transported in huge numbers and then further off into the blocks, into the coastals and uh, and uh, and sprayed everywhere to arrest any potential for disease. So that, in a sense, yes, became the first immediate concrete action mm -hmm. that was that was taken um, or facilitated by us. That was a very beautiful entry management strategy. That sort of gave us a, a kind of a entry a foothold into the thing, where uh, they felt that her experience would be of help. One is a credibility factor and the other is a help. When a calamity strikes and a region is, is the hub of activity or is the epicenter or the most affected, then inevitably the senior most officers of the state, um, uh, their presence uh, is there for a fairly long time. Uh, and that's how Shanta Sheila Nair, who was a, a very senior officer, um, wonderful person and she kind of held the process, she was there. Uh, and then Sushma tells her, ma'am, you need to be uh, aware of one more thing, that uh, we've had a problem, a major problem like this. There'll be a lot of people coming in and a lot of uh, um, miscommunication, misinformation and all that going around. So the first thing that we need to do is bring some sort of a, a, a system and an order into how support is being provided to the people. So then she said, then what do you suggest I do? So Sushma said, uh, why don't you call a meeting of all the NGOs in the evening? So she said, okay. So she gave word, then whoever we met. And you know, everybody camps in front of the collectorate office because that is where you get the information from. So it was just word of mouth telling each one, okay, there's a meeting here at the collectorate in the evening. So on 31st evening, this happened on 26th and by 31st there was this meeting of the civil society organizations okay. with the collector. Uh, and everybody is going to have their own idea of what should be done. Each one is uh, responding in their own way. Uh, how is the government uh, uh, you know, going to be in the know of what is happening and therefore engage constructively with whatever actions are happening on the ground. And more important, how are they going to be able to put uh, policy mechanisms based on the feedback and information that's coming to them over and above what they're getting from their own machinery. Mm -hmm. So the government has its own machinery functioning, but uh, the number of other actors who come in often um, are far more. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so it's very important that you are listening to so many voices, there's such a clamor uh, of what should be done, uh, that two things can happen. Either you shut off the clamor, and you say, I'm not listening to anybody, I'm doing what I think is the best, which is not a great idea for any government to do. Or the other is that uh, you listen to the loudest voice, <laughs> yeah, uh, which may be appropriate, which may not be. Uh, or the third is that uh, you may be listening to many voices simultaneously and you're listening to your own inner voice as the state. You're listening to your own political voice as a state because there's a lot of pressure on governments. 
um, uh, in a, after any calamity and um, there is there is the media there is there are ngos there are there are political representatives there are bureaucrats there are so many actors within the government itself who are who have different perspectives and opinions on what should be done so how how do you ensure that there is some coherence uh, that gets created out of this chaos and uh, one way of doing that is to create a coordination mechanism but none of us knew what a coordination center is only sushma knew what a coordination center is and sushma knew that by pushing it there'll be people against it so it had to be a felt need right okay, okay. so that was another learning that uh, it requires to come as a stated need from the administration only then will it be accepted otherwise it will not be accepted wholly mm -hmm. uh, and that's why setting up coordination mechanisms where you can engage with the state in one voice is very important because that collaboration that engagement enables uh, the state if it is receptive to to listen observe acknowledge and evolve and as the policy evolution happens the communities and people get more options uh and uh get better policies finally as civil society actors that's what you want sips was already working here sneha was already working here so uh she would also ask them whether they are in the areas where tsunami had hit and what were they doing and both these organizations were involved in uh, relief activities so they were already involved you see it is not as if sneha and sips uh, uh just transformed into ncrc they gave birth to ncrc but they were who they were and they had their own work uh, they had their own constituencies uh, who were impacted and they had to continue that these organizations had to continue so uh, they so also they have their interests to keep in mind their interests should not clash with the interests of this uh, collective nc actually ncrc policy and the sneha policies uh, were uh, in uh, in uh, were clashing on some of the sector uh, policies so okay we said okay we whatever it is uh, we th that's also part of the democratic thing if the, as an ngo if sneha believes in something strong and wants to do it so be it but as ncrc even though they are part of it and um, uh, their voice is also heard here we would take sometimes a decision which uh, uh, was not entirely in tune with that so the uh, so that is and another, another part so i'm just telling you many of these partnerships and all were based finally on goodwill and an agreement that you know uh, despite differences our being together is important sneha could have also said you know uh, you know we are not agreeing we can, we, are, we are going to leave in crc so when they were not happy they kept silent and then kept doing their stuff okay. so it's about 78 uh camps that were set up right. these were divided into 10 locations or 13 locations i don't remember that okay. but each staff was given charge of one or two camps okay. or one okay. or two and another thing that happened by then was the collector of uh, nagapatnam was moved out and dr radhakrishnan was brought in the ngos who had worked in gujarat they came back and told us that you will have this glut of ngos and an outpouring of feeling not only ngos a lot of people who had not even had an idea of what has happened it is like a disaster tourism willing to come and saying whatever little they could give so it had to be manned uh, it requires a lot of uh, a lot of surrender it requires a lot of surrender of institutional egos to be able to do that uh it requires a lot of surrender of uh, of bureaucratic egos to be able to share and i think it happened in nagpatnam with mr radhakrishnan he was very very uh, giving and and uh, very generous in in you know inviting seeking support and providing support then she called a bhumika they had the earlier uh, relationship with bhumika as well bhumika gave us 100 mobiles okay that time mobiles were not uh, common yeah. Yeah. so each of these staff members were given mobiles okay. and they were given bikes okay S their work was go in the morning and in the evening okay. and they had um because they were working with the community already mm -hmm. they had community identified community members over there okay. so th those were the nodal members oh, okay. so they just said give us the information in the morning give us the information in the evening right. and that was spoken uh, that was given to uh, the, the that trend 
at that okay. uh, Shamiana office. Okay. okay. That ha, that platform. Interestingly, Amarnath Raja, who had come with me, I told you, who's a computer buff, mm -hmm. had a laptop with him. Okay. And he had this data card. Okay. So he started an Excel worksheet. Okay. So the whole thing started just with that one Excel worksheet. Which are the areas, how many men, how many women, how many children, what are the requirements. Okay. This, uh, since it's a coordination center, um, we also thought that it would be a good idea to know uh, the NGOs who come in. So there was another register set up to uh, I'm a monitor who are the engine. Not monitor exactly, just get the name and addresses and all that. So that had to be put up, this had to be put up. Meanwhile, my husband, Satish, my husband, in Trivandrum, set up a website called tsunami2004.org. Okay. So this was immediately linked to that website and that went global. Okay. So what the beauty of it was that the actual requirements okay. was known to everybody. Okay. So if donors wanted to work here, mm -hmm. they used to go to that yeah, site. Right, okay. Now, uh, that s the way it worked was throughout the day, the NGOs and all that would be coming in, giving us the information and all that. Then the, from the field, we would get information on what is required where, what is the movement. Yeah. Then we would have field staff bringing in their observations from the field. Now, all this would be consolidated and there would be a meeting with the collector between 6 and 7. Okay. And then the collector would have a meeting with his of officials between 7 and 8. So in that, he would also feed in this field level information. So it was a true a sort of a loop was completed in that whole thing. Hmm? So that's the first principle of collaboration coordination that you reach out to all those who, um, who fill in the blanks within you, right? And therefore, you will always be filling in a blank for someone else. And therefore, the state, civil society organizations within themselves, the community and private players and the bilateral and multilateral agencies. All these five uh, have to supplement each other's weaknesses, support each other uh, and in a sense uh, provide uh, the strength to the other. Uh, and each one has to be open to receive that strength from the other. So the success of Nagapatnam model was that the NGOs were manning in the collectorate with the knowledge of the collector and the senior secretaries and providing relief. If you create a process by which the information that's getting captured by the organization in these layered ways in, you know, right from a microcosmic to a macro view and now the organization has the ability and the fora and the space to plough that information back with the government and say this is what is happening here, you need to watch out, you need to be alert, we need to have a policy which is taking care of this. It is this cross-pollination that a good coordination mechanism or structure uh, should try and achieve and I think it was this that NCRC was trying to achieve.